Hello, I'm Jim Michael, President of the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association. We're a chartered nonprofit organization. We have 55 members in five states and two countries. Approximately one third of our membership are doctoral levels. About one third of our membership uh, are professors at one of three Kentucky institutions. For the last 11 years, we've been researching to see what's been going on on this continent before Columbus. We have by chance, not by choice, become the world authority on Prince Maddox. Now some of you viewing this tape are probably wondering who Prince Maddox is, and I understand fully because 10 years ago there wasn't one member in our organization who knew who Prince Maddox was. However, after we started researching the topic, we found and have now a bibliography of over a hundred references to Prince Maddox that were found on this continent. All of those references, except one, say the same story. And that story was the same story that you'd have heard if you had gone in the 1700s, 1800s into any place in the Ohio Valley. Everybody knew Maddox's name. And if you'd gone in, they'd have told you that he was the son of King Owen, that he came over here in 1170 uh, in three boats, stayed for 10 years, went back, convinced his countrymen to come over, they came over in ten boats and were never heard, of, heard from again. That's a basic story that ripples through all of the research that we have together with one exception, and that is a, one reference that we found that says that Maddox was the son of Uther. However, that reference was written in the sixth century by the bards. Little bit of a problem because Maddox was supposed to have sailed in 1170. Now, we have learned that behind every myth and behind every legend, according to our anthropology and archaeology courses, there's usually one nugget of truth, one line of truth, and if you can isolate that fact out, that one nugget of truth, intensify it, test it, prove it, and then kind of expand it, you can usually find out what the true story is. That's what we're going to do with Maddox. So today, I'd like to show you some of the references that we have on Prince Maddox. Now I'd like to uh, address just a couple of the reference materials that are available to you on this continent. First is Richard Deegan's book on Maddox, uh, Discovery of America, written in 1966. A well-written book it is well indexed, and he uses as his proof the Welsh-speaking Indians, the fact that the Welsh-speaking Indians had Bibles, and the fact that four of the governors had knowledge of those Bibles. In fact, the governor of Canada had two of those Bibles in his hands. Unfortunately, the Bibles are gone. The Welsh-speaking Indians are intangible evidence, and so we have, again, no good tangible proof. Next is perhaps one of the best written books outside the United States. This is in Wales, and it's written by a Professor Williams in Wales, and it's written basically about John Evans. John Evans was a 20-year-old Welshman who was sent over here by a group of Welsh uh, men uh, that had joined kind of a syndicate and put up the money to send him over to find a uh, the Welsh-speaking uh, area to develop a Welsh colony over here, perhaps get away from the Anglo-Saxon English uh, tyranny. Anyway, Evans got up into the Dakotas uh, at the turn of the century, and unfortunately, the he got to the Mandan Indians, but there's no evidence that the Mandan Indians ever spoke the Welsh language. And he came back as the lines behind him, the Spanish lines, he had to join the, the Spanish in order to get up there. The Spanish lines all crumbled and the Louisiana Purchase came in in 1803 and he never got back up again and uh, he ended up an alcoholic in St. Louis and New Orleans. But again, there was no proof in that particular uh, book except Williams did come over, talked to the Mandan Indians that are still up in North Dakota today, and said, 
and asked them, where did you come from? What is your heritage? And they said, we came across the water. An intangible uh, finding and again, no solid proof. Uh, Prince Maddox, founder of, of, of uh, Clark County, Indiana. This book is uh, right across the river from, from Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from. And it's based on Sand Island here, where in 1799, military men found in shallow graves uh, individuals who had brass breastplates with a harp, a mermaid, and some letters that looked Latin on them. Unfortunately, those brass plates have disappeared. Uh, one reference a, uh, says that they went up to Cincinnati. Another one says to Virginia. But anyway, they're gone. Again, no tangible proof. And uh, Dean Olson does not have a, any references in his, any bibliography in his uh, book. And <clears throat> perhaps the best novel on this continent is written by James Alexander Tom the author of Follow the River, which was a, a Hallmark Hall of Fame production, and also Tecumseh that was on PBS, uh, many of you may have seen. But Children of Man, of First Man, is about Maddock. The thing I like about this particular novel is he does have Maddock dying in Tennessee, which we think is correct. Now, I'm going to be presenting today for you the, the proofs that we have found and let you make up your mind as to whether or not you feel that Prince Maddox is fact or fiction. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be showing you his coat of arms, his secret symbol for God, the secret symbol for heaven, the national emblem that's still being used today, his brass bracelets found with his body, his epitaph stone with his name on it in a dead alphabet, and then uh, his jawbone, which is in the Smithsonian, and then his eulogy that tells the story why he came over here, how he came over here, and who he is. This is what I have for you today. Now, I'd like to start with this historical marker that was put up by the Daughters of the American Revolution down in Mobile Bay, and it's based on the work of John Sevier, the first governor of Tennessee, who said that he felt that Maddock had landed in Mobile Bay. This is now in a museum uh, down in the uh, Mobile Bay area. Now, some of you are asking, where is Wales? And in the 6th century, there was no Wales, but it was called Britannia. And they controlled all of what is the British Isles today, including Ireland and Brittany down in France. They at the 6th century, 7th century, the Saxons and the Jutes and the Angles moved in and pushed the Welsh into what is right here, this particular part right here. Now, I want you to concentrate on that because here it is. And this is South Wales. And the three things I want you to see here, first of all, Cardiff which is the capital of Wales. Then we have Milford Haven Harbor here, perhaps the largest harbor in all of Europe, 30-mile harbor, beautifully protected, and there are eight references to 700 boats sailing from this harbor in the 8th century. Then I'd like for you to look up here, if you will, at the the national flag, which is a dragon. It has wings of a bird, a serpent tail, uh, four feet and a body of an animal. Uh, this is in Louisville, Kentucky, the first president of the Filson Club, Reuben Durrett. And in 1908, he wrote this book, and perhaps this is the best book on Maddock available. You'd have to get this through interlibrary loan, but it's called The Traditions of the Earliest Visits of Foreigners to North America. And Durrett after the 15th page begins with Maddock and the whole rest of the book, the whole contents as you see from there on, is on Maddock and the Welsh-speaking Indians and the Welsh tradition. 
Now, in 1908, he apologizes for regurgitating all this information on Maddock again because he assumes everybody's already heard it and known it, and yet none of us had heard of it uh, in the uh, 1980s when we started researching this. But this is what Durrett says. He says the two uh, post-Columbian authors that wrote about Maddock, the first one was Richard Hacklewood, and he wrote in 1582. Now, he took his work out of an abbey from, the, from Guten Owen, who was a bard, the author of the work that told about Maddock and his trip over here and what have you. And this is the man that put King Owen as the father of Maddock and also the 1170 into the, into the project here. Two years later, Dr. David Powell in 1584 writes the same story based on another abbey and another bard. This bard's name is Karadik of Lancarvin. And the same story, but again, David Powell doesn't know when Maddox sailed or the incidentals about who his father was, so he just tacks it right on to Hecklut's work. But he noted that Crotic died in 1156. So the sailing of Maddox in 1170 is beginning to become a real problem, at least to me. So I wrote two whales, and I had at that time two references. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of the material had the story on Maddock coming over in three ships and the ki son of King Owen, but there was one that said that he was the son of, of Uther. I sent that uh, manuscript from the 6th century along with this particular dilemma and asked them to help us research it. Uh, Alan Wilson and Brom Blackett, who were the men that we were working with at that time, really weren't interested in looking at this because they thought this had been well researched. They were more interested in looking uh, for their, their roots back in the Mediterranean before Christ. But they said, all right, we'll help you look for him. And they started out and they found Walter Mapp, an author writing uh, in 1135 about Maddock and the whole story. And then they found Sheriff Fleming, the high sheriff of Cardiff, writing in 1100, and they said, oh my, you've got the wrong Maddock, the wrong century. And so then they went back to Hacklut's source, which was Guten Owen, and they found that Guten Owen had written Owen ap Maddock, or Madog, okay? This ap means son of, or it can mean descendant of. But this is a real problem to Hacklut, who wanted to establish a date before Columbus for the monarchy, and there was no Maddox king in that he could get a tag on as far as a date. He knew when King Owen lived, but he didn't know when Maddox lived. So to solve his particular dilemma and to make a political statement, and that was that the Brits got here on this continent before the Spanish, he simply shifted it around to Maddock ep on. And I'm sure that other, uh, others came and looked at this source of reference and found this particular thing, but after it had gone down in print and accepted by the Tudor monarchy, I'm sure that there was a great reluctance to change it or to rock the boat. So it has sat as a dinosaur in print for these uh, 1,400 years. And consequently, we have all these stories over and over and over about Maddox sailing in 1170, which are not true, and that's how Maddox got lost in history. Now, I'd like to take you to Loudoun County, Tennessee. Uh, it's not too far from Knoxville. This dig was in 1886. They found this stone this is an enlargement. This picture was in Argosy in 1970. Uh, there were some what they called copper bracelets, some wooden ear spools with it. The wood has carbon dated to 1,500 years before present, plus or minus 170, puts it into a possible 6th century situation. 
and the bracelets here's a better picture of them uh, they turn out to be 29 percent zinc three percent lead and the rest copper they were not totally copper and we're told by our archaeologists on this continent that nothing was smelted here so this definitely has to be old world this is brass and these bracelets are brass and from the old world this is the hand of my 13 year old nephew to give you an idea of the size of this uh, this is about the size of a Hershey bar and you see the lettering on it now it was translated in the 70s they thought this might mean Hebrews or Jews and so it was translated for the Hebrews then in the 78 or 79 it was translated comet for the Hebrews reading it this way the fact is they didn't utilize all of the markings on the stone it translates the ruler Madoc thou art distinctly and so there you have an epitaph stone on uh, possibly Prince Maddock in Loudoun County uh, down in Tennessee now I'd like to come back to Kentucky for a minute and I have to explain to you that if I find something it means absolutely nothing if you find something it means absolutely nothing it doesn't exist if Russ Burroughs finds a whole cave full of things, it means nothing because an archaeologist has not pegged it in time and has not evaluated it and so forth. So I have to, and we're, we're locked into a situation where we have to document everything that we're working with as far as proof with archaeologists and archaeologically found proof. And here is a statement from one of the first archaeologists in Kentucky, the head of the archaeological department, William Webb, and he wrote in Ancient Life in Kentucky back in, in 1928, and he made this statement. He said, it is therefore difficult to refrain from drawing a conclusion uh, which would tend to support the Welch theory. Now, he based this conclusion on four factors two intangible and two tangible now he said for the tangible ones that they found all over Kentucky stone slab graves certainly not Native American in origin then he noted that the bones that were found were of individuals that were six to seven foot uh, in height certainly not Native American now he then coupled those two facts with a couple intangible things one was the fact that there were welsh speaking indians running all around the country well documented in fact he puts one in his book uh, incident in kentucky and then he also couples it with the fact uh, of the legend of maddock and the tradition of the welsh coming over here now if he had made this statement today he would have lost his tenure at the University of Kentucky. He would have lost his job and probably would not have been uh, hireable by any institution in the country. Yet this does stand, and I want to use it for further reference because we're going to use his material. Now this is a composite stone which he found. It is a circle with a cross in the center of it. Here it is. Uh, sketched out for us by him in his book and you'll note also that they found a bear's tooth and on that bear's tooth they found a what he called a Maltese cross now he's ignoring the fact that for a thousand years all the kings of the British Isle have and Queens have had this same cross in their crown as well as the Prince of, of Wales wore this same cross uh, that's a gimme. I'm not even considering that as part of our, our, our factual proof. But I am going to take this one into consideration because here is a series of 12 dots arranged in a traffic arrow or a arrow configuration. This is an Awin sign to these people. And I'm the first one on this continent that knew what it was, so there's no way that any of this material could be faked. And this was found in 1919. I'd like to then go back here for just a minute to this. I've been criticized that this is Native American and therefore I'm taking from the Native Americans something that is rightfully theirs. They certainly know how to make a circle cross and could have invented it independently. Well, that's a very strong possibility. However, 
and, and they say as their proof, the axis of this is not up and down. If this is a gorget and these were holes where you'd put a leather strap through it and hang it, this cross does not go straight up and down as all the Celtic crosses that you see today. Well, that may have been true or may be true today, but it may not have been true back in the 6th and 7th century. The cross was not necessarily straight up and down as you see in this, in this uh, uh, grave marking. Now, what does it mean? This, as you would look up if you were in the Mediterranean or in Europe, if you'd look up into the heavens, you would see Orion for man, uh, Leo the lion, Taurus the bull, and the eagle at four quadrants of the sky, and then smack in the center you'd see Polaris. So this is their sky heaven as you look at it. It's their symbol for heaven. It's much older than the Brits. They brought this symbol with them. It can be found all through the Mediterranean, but it's certainly found in the British Isles and it will be found with these dots even in it. And also has become the British flag, if you will, eventually with the stripes through it as such. So that's what it means. Now, in the museum at Lexington, University of Kentucky, they also have what they call a chunky stone or a gaming stone. Now this uh, stone has at the bottom of it that same three stroke broad arrow they call it, or ah win sign. I sent this, a picture of this over to Wales and asked Alan Wilson and Brom Blackett what they made of it and they sent me back six more and then I started researching Heinrich Schliemann's work because the six that they sent me were from Troy. Been, they dug up something like 200 or 200 to 400 of these things. And they, were, they had arrows going every which direction, they had them in dots and they had them solid. But these were whirls, and how it works is you put a stick through the bottom of it, and then you wrap your twine around it, and this is how you make your yarn, your thread for knitting and what have you. And the mummies that were found in four quadrants of Kentucky all had a, a manufactured cloth wrapping around them of some kind. Nobody knew how they did it, but they certainly did it. And uh, this is, I believe, how that was done like a little flywheel that goes around. In Wales, a couple blocks from Alan Wilson's home, is this bridge with the Awin uh, sign on it. Now, it's also on churches. It can also be found on pews, on prison jackets. Uh, it's a trilogy symbol. It's called an Awin uh, sign. And it's on everything that the government has. The English government has picked it up as an as a emblem. They probably don't really know what it is, but we do. It is very ancient. In fact, in 1862, in the book on Bard, Bardism, here it is at the very beginning of the book, and going back to 51 BC to Strabo, he discusses Bardism, and he says that the bards had three different classifications. The bards at the very top level, which were the historians, the workers, they wore sky blue robes, sign of peace, and they were not permitted to use the name of God orally. They had to make this sign when they used his name and refer to this symbol. Uh, the Ovates took 11 years to become an Ovate. They wore green robes symbol of progress, and they could use the name of God between each other, but they couldn't use the name of God with the bards or with the common people. So they, again, had to use this symbol in referring to God. But the Druids, who were the high priests, the rabbis, the professors, if you will, they could use it openly. The name, of course, was Yahweh. And so they did. They wore white for holiness. Now another stone, this was found in 1937, again by William Webb, so therefore it exists, is again a circle cross, this time on a conch shell or a mussel shell. We're not exactly sure. But he did note that it had three chevrons uh, going in each quadrant. He noted that it had chevrons. So he said circle cross with, with chevrons. 
they, he ignored the fact that it has an EA right up here in the corner, which stands for Ia or Yah or Yahweh. And, and of course, he did not understand what the chevrons meant. Uh, <clears throat> Sheriff, up where he found that stone, uh, also did a lot of digging. In fact, every time they put in a, a, a septic system up there, he's right there with his shovel to help him out, and he digs right along with them, and then he picks up the artifacts. And he has a million-dollar museum in his basement, but none of it exists because he found it, and not an archaeologist. But I want to show you again the, the chevrons going up, the chevrons going down. Here's another thing that he found, chevrons going up, chevrons going down. Chevrons were all over the place question is what do they mean and so we did find the same configuration the circle cross with the chevrons in it at Stonehenge found by archaeologists therefore it exists on a button and this is a gold button dug up by archaeologists with the same symbol Stonehenge now I'd like to take you to Cardiff to the land of cathedral this cathedral was chartered in 560 to 570 time frame and has been rebuilt since parts of it have. Uh, it has as on the charter the founder's name uh, King Myrig. Uh, right below King Myrig's name is Madog. And so Madog is a son of a Uther because Myrig was a Uther. And here is the actual lineage. We have King Myrig who used the name Uther. His father Theodric uh, used the name Uther. Arthur I used the name Uther and Arthur II used the name Uther. And here's Madoc down here. So uh, Myrig dies in about uh, 570 when the church was dedicated. Okay, here is in his chapel uh, a glass window with his family crest. This is the crest of the Glamorgan kings, so it would have been his, would have been Arthur II, and it would have been Maddox's uh, family placard or family crest. Now at Cardiff Castle, again the, the crest, the family crest, and also of course the national emblem, the dragon. You notice here the wings and the tail of the serpent, the four feet with the talons, and so on. Now I'd like to go now to Illinois. The first white men that entered Illinois, uh, Jacques Marquette, Father Marquette, came down the river, sent down by the governor of Canada, uh, hoping that he and, and Louise Joliet could find a passageway to the Pacific. He came down the Ohio and the, and the uh, uh, Mississippi rivers and when he got to Illinois he was befriended by some Indians who he calls the Illinois Indians and they gave him this peace pipe as he went further on down and got to the Arkansas River he was surrounded by Native Americans who had Spanish weapons when he saw that he realized that he was going into the Gulf of Mexico and he turned around and came back he held up the peace pipe which saved his life they might have killed him he got back to the St. Louis area and across the river from St. Louis where Alton is today Alton Illinois he saw what he noted in his diary as a monster on the rocks it was a huge bird of some type and he sketched it. Unfortunately, the sketch was lost when his canoe tipped over, but it still remained in his notes as Monster on the Rocks, and today it exists this way. It has been reconstructed on metal and replaced on the river. If you go up there, this is what you see. It's about four miles from the place where it originally was, but that area has been quarried away. It does have the wings of a bird. It does have uh, the split tail and it does have the you'll notice a halo and almond eyes but get a little clearer for you uh, this isn't the way it originally was and this is an artist's liberty that he took this is what it looked like back in 1954 in Fate magazine and it does have the serpent tail. 
It does have the wings of a bird. It does have the talon claws. And you notice that the tail isn't split, but it has that diamond point or arrow head shaped point. The eyes are not almond eyes. They are the round Chaldean eyes. This is a Welch dragon. And this was on the wall there in plain sight for everyone at that time. In fact, it was there when Evans was in St. Louis. If he'd simply gone across the river, he would have seen this and made a lot of this work redundant. Okay, here is the Welch dragon, the way it looked in 1840 on a school wall. And you see the arrow tail. You notice these paws, dead giveaway that this is a Welch dragon. So there's no other animal in history of mythology or anything that resembles this four-footed bird. Okay, one other little symbol I want to bring to your attention, that is the swastika, which appears in all Native American artwork today. Uh, this is on a, in Ireland on a tombstone with the circle cross, or Celtic cross it's called, and the swastika. Joe Mahan's book, The Secret, on page 157, has the Yuchi coat of arms. And in there, it says, and it shows the drawing of the swastika, and it calls it the breath master. The breath master. Thomas, in the Bible, says that after we created man, the Holy Ghost breathed life into him. The breath master, the Native Americans were saying, is the Holy Ghost. The swastika is their symbol for the Holy Ghost or the four winds. And here you have that symbol, the swastika for the Holy Ghost. But we also have serpents with wings. In the center we have symbol for heaven. So we have here the bird serpent, bird in the Mayan language is Quetzal, a Quetzal bird, and then Quetzal is the serpent. So the bird serpent in the swastika configuration with the uh, symbol of heaven, this is our proof that Maddox was Quetzal Quetzal. Now, back in Kentucky, in 1820, in the home of an entrepreneur, friend of Raffinesk, our first historian, was this three-headed vase. Now this vase has predominant eyes all the way around it. Joseph Campbell did research on these eyes as, and, and traced them as they came out of the Mesopotamian area through the Mediterranean around the Iberian Peninsula on up to Britain. As he did that, he also traced the chevrons that came with them the same route. The same people brought them. These were the Cumric people. And the ancient Brits traced their roots the same way. They came from Ur, from the Mesopotamian area. They came out with several uh, stops and then eventually got to Britain. These two maps superimpose on each other and show you how the chevrons got to Britain as well as how these all-seeing eyes got to Britain. Now, in the island of Man, in Ireland, and also uh, in Germany, we have these three-headed configurations. This is stone, and this one happens to be a jug. But these were outlawed. These were uh, considered pagan and were uh, supposed to have been destroyed. One is 200 B.C., one is 300 B.C. They were supposed to have been destroyed. Fortunately, they weren't, and we found these in museums. So this is the three-headed trilogy of these ancient people that was part of their culture. Now, in the church back in Cardiff Cathedral, King Myrig's church, at every one of the ceiling joists, there was a head. Now, there were originally a three-headed configuration like this with four eyes, the all-seeing eyes. Everywhere you go, that eye follows you. This configuration was ordered to be destroyed, and in the 11th century they did that. They destroyed all, but they had Welchmen destroy them, and the Welchmen saved this one. It's still there today, and we filmed it. 
Okay, uh, this is the alphabet that was on the wall in 1840 in the schoolroom in Wales. You notice it starts with the Awin sign, and there's your alphabet. This is a stone that was found at Brandenburg, about 40 miles from Louisville, uh, now at the Falls of the Ohio in a million dollar museum there, but you notice the letters go right across the stone. Uh, the fellow that found it in 1912 took it to several state fairs, uh, broke it into three parts so that easier to carry. Uh, uh, geologists looked at it and said, gee, it was made by natural causes, which you'd expect them to say. We don't think so. Uh, we think that's very hard to, uh, to uh, substantiate because these letters are cut in uh, equally all the way across the stone in a straight line, about the same height. They're cut into the stone the same depth, and every letter on this stone translates. It is, in fact, a type of a, a uh, uh, constitution, and it says, toward strength, divide the land we're spread over, between our offspring in wisdom. And that's exactly what the Ten Tribes philosophy was. The Anglo-Saxon English didn't feel that way. The oldest male got everything. The next in line went in the monastery or went in the Navy, Army, and so on. Not so. This stone is still intact and it's there uh, in the museum, hopefully for everyone to, to see. Like to go up the Ohio River to Wheeling, West Virginia, and down 10 miles to Moundville, and a little place called Grave Creek. There is an 80-foot mound there that was dug into in 1828 by the owner, and he found two burial chambers there. In the top burial chamber, he found this turkey egg-shaped stone, or sized stone, with 25 different letters on it. Now, he didn't know what the letters were, and in 1840, Henry Schoolcraft came to take a look at it, and he said, yes, it is an alphabet. I don't know which one. Henry Schoolcraft was married to a half Ojibwe woman. He'd been an Indian agent at a frontier post in Wisconsin, and he knew the traditions of Maddox. He certainly knew the traditions of, of the Welsh-speaking Indians all over the continent. He should have thought that the Welsh-speaking Indians had an alphabet, uh, particularly if they had Bibles, but he still wrote to Copenhagen, okay? They wrote him back and said, yes, 15 of these letters are identifiable as Old British. Then he wrote to Paris, and he said, yes, this alphabet is on our continent, as well it should be. It's called Celt-Iberian. These people went through the Iberian area and left their alphabet all over the place and later came back uh, and conquered Brittany and so on and left it again. So yes, it should be there. And again, he did not write to Britain. He simply wrote to Tunisia and to find out if maybe one of the letters was Phoenician. It wasn't. He wrote to Rome and then he wrote to Greece and he got lost. And so did the alphabet get lost. But if you look at the very first letter here, it looks like an upside down four. And if you look at the actual letter in the alphabet, it's a combination letter of an RH. No place else in the world does this kind of an alphabet exist or this kind of a letter. Yes, it is the same alphabet. And yes, we have 55 of these translated messages throughout the country. These messages went all the way to Pittsburgh, all the way up the river to Davenport, Iowa. So. Uh, we know that it was all that they were all over the continent. Now, uh, this is Taliesin's history, but if you try to read it, you have a little bit of a problem because it's written in this same alphabet. The Welsh uh, Heritage Council or Foundation over there, the head of it, found another book with 146 just within the last month or so. Uh, so old that the pages are crumbling. They have to photograph each of the pages. They can't copy it, but it's all written again in this Colburn alphabet. Taliesin, in his poem, says, They know not the brindled ox. Brindled is dun-colored. Uh, thick his head, or superfluous his head, oversized head, 
uh, headband, seven score knobs or knuckles in his collar. So seven score would be like 120 uh, hands, knuckles, going around. So he's, here is an ox, an oxen of some kind that is brown, dun colored, that has a great big collar on it, a big furry collar. And there's only one place in the world that that kind of an animal exists, and it has to be on this continent. This was written in Britain in the 6th century, and these people did not know about this animal. So they had to have been over here to write this. The author who wrote this is Taliesin. Taliesin had to be over here to see it and write it. And then he says, uh, when we went with Arthur of anxious memory, which means Arthur is dead, uh, except seven, none returned from the fortress of abundance. And that's part of his poem. Now here is a million dollar shot. When Alan Wilson was here from Wales on this continent, we suspected that the copper portions of the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in his Colburn ancient alphabet because they said that some of the letters were Greek, some of them weren't, some of them were code, and so on. It just sounded too fishy. Anyway, for 40 years they've been struggling trying to translate it. We went to the Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and we were able to get access to the actual uh, pictures of the copper portions of the Dead Sea Scroll, and sure enough, it is his alphabet. This was taken five minutes after he opened the book and at the same time as he said, yes, this is our alphabet. Uh, the people that are working with this alphabet don't want our help, don't want our information. We've tried to give it to them. We've tried to fax them this information. They have refused us. They're getting $40,000 grants to translate it. They think it's Greek. So we've left them alone. Okay, uh, the four ancient books of Wales, and it says here, Cumric poems known to be or attributed to the bards of the 6th century. This is what's available on this continent, both written in Welsh and in English. And it's, it has Skeen's name, he's a Scotsman. He paid a preacher to translate this. Unfortunately, it was done in haste. And so consequently about every tenth word, maybe every fifth word is not the right word because some of those words have four or five meanings. If you pick the wrong one, it, it messes up the whole thing. So consequently, even though it's here, it's a dinosaur in print because it's not necessarily translated correctly. This is the page that I mentioned to you before that said Maddox was son of Uther. This is the page I sent over and said we better take a look at this. It also had some other things on the page which you can recognize. It talks about the treacheries of Jesus, it talks about the earth quaking, elements of darkness all over the world, shadow on the world, baptism of trembling, and impotency which possibly is radiation. Certainly sounds like a uh, freak of nature, certainly an act of God or it treachery of Jesus, as they said. But anyway, I sent it to Alan, and they retranslated this. And uh, uh, look at the very first sentence to give you an idea of how bad this is. It says, Maddox, joy to the wall. The actual translation by Alan Wilson is, Maddox, firm of intellect. Maddock, foremost chief, it came to pass the grave. It came to pass at the fortress of abundance, this continent. From and in connection with a feat, he was blown over here by something. Son of Uther, foremost chief to slaughter. Well done, thy hand set forward. He came to Eroff. They thought Eroff was a person's name. It's not. It's two words. E-R means toward. OF means raw or virgin territory. Eroff is this continent. He came to Eroff, a vessel full and complete. The vessel was not destroyed by whatever brought him over here. A verging point of disagreement. He didn't mean to come. Sadness at discord. He was really upset. To the limit of what exists, to the end of the earth, to the aggregate complete Eroff, which means Eroff, our continent, was still intact. Theirs was really hit hard by something. The wounds of Isu, uh, they don't have a J, so Isu is Jesus, with he in belief. 
this is an act of God, the earth in tremble with resembling close to blackness, almost like a nuclear blackout, and sweating upon the world, and baptism upon conflict, a leap to disagreement, he came to Eroff, a vessel full and complete. Mountain ground in good order, amongst cold devils, maybe Native Americans, to a place that's at the bottom of hell, the actual word is abyss, which is a place from which there is no return. There is Maddox epitaph, and, or excuse me, eulogy, and it tells you who he is. He's son of Uther, tells you how he got here and why he got here. Now, to confirm what this is, a astrophysicist at Oxford University named Victor Klub in 1992 said that it was a comet that hit. And he based that on several other writings of different people. You've already seen one that we've shown you. And then this is backed up a year or so later by a professor in Dublin, Ireland, who said using dendrochronology, tree ring circles, that something stunted the growth in the middle 6th century over there. And that's true. Whatever it was that struck Britain went all the way across and hit Ireland, killing everything in its path. That which lived, it killed the animals, the fish, the earthworms, everything. But that which lived moved out of the way. That's when we think that the Scots moved up to where Scotland is today. And the, the Brits went down to Brittany to save their life and return maybe 10 years later because the land was not even plowable, tillable for 10 years. So based on that comet, we can now peg the time for you. We think that it happened, Maddox was at sea in 562. The comet struck Britain at that time, causing tremendous tidal waves, throwing him into the Sargasso Sea because he's called Maddox of the seaweed. And the Sargasso is a seaweed that grows down in that area, floats on the top. Uh, Maddox returns 10 years later to Britain. They don't believe him. They say, you can't be alive for 10 years. Your boat would have fallen apart and so on. He explains about this continent. And then they send out Admiral Gwyneth to verify Maddox star for uh, maps. And Admiral Gwyneth comes back the following years and says, yes, Maddox is right on. He's exactly accurate. There is another continent over there. It does look like it's tillable. It looks like it's uninhabitable and therefore a good place to go. The king sets sail in 574. He's killed four years later on this continent by a naked savage in a volley of arrows. And he's then mummified, kept over winter, and he's taken back to Britain in 79, placed in a cave. And I've, I have here an unmarked tomb not necessarily so, but they thought it was unmarked at the time. Since this slide was made, they've gone back and reviewed the film they made at the time. They found the cave, and over the stone sarcophagus, it was about eight feet by, by five, they, and about four or five feet deep, they had originally filmed all the way to the end of the cave and then right up overhead, and there was an inscription written in this alphabet Say, talking about Uther and the fact that he was impotent. Okay, then uh, Merlin in, eight, in 580 writes Voyage to Another World, and then the king is taken out. We're not sure when, but we do know that when Maddox's son, Morgan, becomes 14 years of age, they take the king out and rebury him at St. Peter's Church. We've dug the church. Unfortunately, he's not in the church. His sto epitaph stone is there with his father's name and his name on it. We think he's in a mound next to the church. There's a great big egg-shaped or boat-shaped circular mound as big as a football field. And at the, if it was a boat, in the sternsman's position is a 130-foot long Indian mound, right, uh, with a burial in it. It's unmarked. It's not a... Uh, registered mound in Britain, but we think that this King Arthur is in that mound with his golden uh, 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 armor on and a face mask that they made. They, they pounded it together so they would recognize him when they brought him back. Okay, 
So today I have shown you uh, the chevrons, which were the, which was Maddox coat of arms. Uh, we've the circle cross, the symbol of heaven, the Awen signs. Uh, again, I'm the first one to recognize these on this continent as such. Uh, his national banner, certainly the dragon on this continent, the brass bracelets which were found in his grave, his epitaph stone in his dead language, and his eulogy as, as jawbone. If we had only one thing here, the eulogy probably is the best of all because it tells who he is, how he came, and why he came. Now that would be the end of my presentation if it weren't, weren't for one other thing. I mentioned to you that Arthur had been killed by a volley or a shower of arrows. That's what the historical uh, legends are. And I just show you this as reference. Because in this little town called Stoke Dry, England, but it was still in the British Empire, which would be Welsh Empire in those days, is this ancient church. Now this church has been rebuilt and it was being renovated again in, in 1972. And in 1972 they uh, were taking the whitewash off the walls. Sometime in the Renaissance uh, all of the graffiti or all of the, the uh, Michelangelo artwork, what have you, was ordered to be uh, painted over, whitewashed over, and this was. As they started taking it off, they say, hey, there's writing under, there, there's something under there, and this is what they found. So we would like to concentrate on this particular part here because we have a very young king here with a crown with ten arrows on each side of his body, uh, a Native American with a feather, a bow, a loincloth, multiple feathers on this naked savage, and a bow. And when they found this, they didn't know what to make of it. It was on Midland's television, and they said, well, this is proof that the Vikings got to America, came back here dressed up like Native Americans, came back and killed our King Edmund in 860, 140 years before the Vikings got to Vinland. A little hard to swallow, a little hard to believe. We know what it is. But anyway, we would never name a town or a city or anything with such an evil, horrible name as Stoke Dry. Because, ladies and gentlemen, Stoke Dry means evil blow.